you worked with uh, someone, uh, you know, well, Paul Lynn. Yeah, I worked with Paul. Now, he was a legendary Jew hater, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. He? <laughs> well, you know, he was, Paul, on one drink was wonderful, and on two drinks, he was the Wansee Conference. He was the Luftwaffe <laughs> High Command. Hilarious. He was, you know, <laughs> you lousy kike, how you fucked me over, you goddamn cunt. And he it just and so you the goal was to keep him on one drink and not to get the second glass of wine because it was all and, and the Jews were like every, they were the cause of all of his troubles and of course he was surrounded by Jews his managers were two Jews incredible Ray Katz and Sandy Gallen and everybody in his significant in his life was Jews but the other reason he was he was annoyed was he um, he always felt that he was a he was a big star and had made a lot of money, but he, he'd come up in New York with other people. Colin and, Ray. Well, yeah. yeah, but specifically Woody Allen and Mel Brooks had become movie stars. Oh, I see what you mean. And Paul was always like the guy, Rock Hudson's psychiatrist. Right. You know, or the, the next door neighbor to, to, to Doris Day or someone like that. And uh, be, basically it started with Bye Bye Birdie, which was his biggest acting role. Um, where he played the harassed father, you know, the suburban dad, and uh, and he never got to where they were, and it just pissed him off. And decided it's because they were Jews, and I kept <laughs> I kept saying to him, "They write their own material, come up with stuff, and they make their movies." Yes, that's a good they point. Are, you know, they are two filmmakers. And they generate their own stuff, and it's not because they're Jews. It's because they're brilliant and they're funny, and uh, and they have this other skill set that you know you don't have. Aside from the fact that you know, Paul was a, a great flavor. I mean, he was he right. was exhibited best on the squares because he would come in, would do that the one line and get out. And it's it's hard to carry something when he they gave him a sitcom. Oh, the temperature's rising. Yeah, well, yeah. that was the second one. Oh, right, Paul Lynch, Paul Lynch show, show, which had a huge first week, and the second week was half the first week because right. he didn't really carry. You know, it's very hard for the antic character to be the central character in a sitcom because basically you have to have a cool character who is surrounded by colorful people. I mean, think Van Dyke, Mary Tyler New Moore. Heart. New heart. I right. mean, those are the things that, that right. work. It's rare that you get uh, Archie Bunker. I mean, it, uh, that was a, a magical combination. But, he, I mean, Maud was too hot to last, you know, as a soul, the center of the thing. And Paul was just uh, the wrong guy to be the centerpiece of a show. But great when you'd see him like as Uncle Arthur exactly on right. Bewitched. Exactly when he right. had to so, come in steal scene. Yeah. So, um, uh, so it did, that never happened. And they bought him out and put him on Donnie and Marie. As a regular, at the salary he would have gotten had he been doing his own show, so he was making a ton of money. And then we would do specials, but they were special by the nature of it. And we would surround him with funny people, and so he wouldn't have to be on that much. You know, we'd have Betty White and and right, uh, right, right. other people around him doing things. Florence Henderson, Florence, well, Florence, yeah, exactly. We had that Halloween show with everybody. I'm glad you got there because we yeah, were going to get there eventually. No, it was fun. I mean, <laughs> and Kiss. You know, and uh, um, and witches. He was a witch, and, and he didn't know who Kiss Margaret was. Margaret Hamilton is the wicked That's witch. What of I was going to ask you and about her. Witchy poo. Billy Hayes. Billy Hayes. We had all. We had witches. We had Tim Conway. We had Roz Kelly, Pinky Tuscadero. <laughs> yes. Happy. We had every. I mean, we had about twelve guest stars on that show. So it was, he was well protected. And and who came first, Paul Lynn or Alice Ghost? Well, everybody wondered. They came together, although probably yeah. not in the same room. But they, <laughs> they were both, I believe, in New Faces of Fifty Two, and Leonard Silman discovered them both and put them in the show. And they were, and what I, I was too young to have seen it. And the movie, there's a movie of it, but it, you don't really get the flavor of them too much. You you can't figure I mean they the claim always was one of them imitated the other and that and that they became the same person as, as it went along. But uh I, I never was sure who it was the funniest of all is that I mean like Paul has been dead for forty years. If he has knew he been the, forty already? Nineteen eighty one wow. or eighty two. Wow. And uh, if he thought that we would be talking about him, he would be stunned because in his mind he hadn't made it. He hadn't done anything. He'd made money, but he hadn't become 
An icon. That, an icon. Yeah. Uh, that figure. And, he and would now be, he is. He would be absolutely amazed. Watching that Paul Lynn special, first of all, I mean, you, you're <laughs> yeah. talking about the assortment of drugs. Well, yeah. I mean, it, like you said Tim Conway, Betty White, Kiss. <laughs> it's just, yeah. it, it's it's the perfect 70s TV special. He's a, he's a trucker, right? It's he's like a trucker at one point, trucker. and he's covered in rhinestones. Because I guess he's a it's rhinestone a, I, trucker. Yeah, I guess it's a Glenn Campbell. The, the yeah, show song was, was on the right. charts, and then he and he and Tim Conway fight over Pinky oh, Tuscadero right. in a over, in a yeah. trucker bar. I mean, it's unbelievable. And he didn't know who Kiss was. Is that true? He didn't know who Kiss was. <laughs> he didn't know who Kiss was. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Gilbert, you've but seen it, yes? He didn't, Yo, know, yes. He didn't know who Kiss was, but he uh, he we he was profoundly depressed when when they brought over the president of their fan club, and that was Ringo's daughter. Oh, interesting! This is way back then, and he knew who Ringo was, and he was kind of like, he has she he has a daughter. She's <laughs> old enough to do this. <laughs> And that made him feel old. But at the, at the time we were shooting the thing, I mean, he didn't know who anybody was really except like you know, from golden age people. Um, but Roots had been, was on. And it was a huge success, gigantic success. And we were standing outside because I think they had just passed a cigarette law. We were standing outside the soundstage smoking. And Paul was in a cape and a witch's hat <laughs> smoking. And LeVar Burton, who played Quinta sure. Quinte, walked by with a little entourage of people because he was going to do, I don't know, Live with Regis or something like that that used to be on that lot. And he's walking by, and, and he sees Paul. And Paul, of course, doesn't remember his name. Doesn't do, just looks at him and goes, Roots! <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, and, much to his credit, LeVar Burton just burst out laughing. Cause <laughs> what else so, can you do? Here's a guy in a wizard outfit. <laughs> <laughs> that voice. What was Margaret Hamilton like? She was adorable. Yeah. She was, a, a, at the, that point, a very old lesbiterian. Yes. <laughs> you know? Lesbiterian. And she was lesbiterian, and she had, of course, lived on the down low for many years. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. And uh, she was living in Gramercy Park here in New York. And uh, she was pretty frail, and she didn't come out much, but she just couldn't resist this, the, the opportunity to do this thing and with Billy Hayes, who she admired a lot. Right, and she thought it would be, right. it would be like her uh, kind of swan song to just do uh, The Wicked Witch of the Wisp one more time. And she was, she was just really funny and, of course, you know, told all the stories, and, and uh, everybody flocked to her and, and all that. But I did get a kick out of her because every now and again, uh, you know, they would like— some gorgeous girl would walk by and she would nudge me in the elbow. <laughs> Get me her number, would you? <laughs> I love it. But I'm sorry, she's dating Marjorie Maine. <laughs> Marjorie Maine. <laughs> well, Marjorie Maine was another lesbian. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm aware. And you did that that very surreal Star Wars oh, yeah. holiday oh, yeah. special. I did. We had Steve Binder in With here Steve too. Steve Binder. Yeah. Well, he was called in. I know he was the second guy. He was, yeah. Yeah. It was uh He's oddly was proud of it, by the way. Well, you know, we, we look, first of all, it was the seventies, so we were we were on everything really <laughs> but skateboards. I mean <laughs> we could have been if we could if we if we had had any balance left from all the weed we smoked. But I mean, if we had thought that forty years later we'd be talking about it, we would have paid closer attention. I mean it was uh, in the the world of television, it was not unusual to do something insane uh, just to get the audience's uh, attention. You know, uh, Wayne Newton at SeaWorld. I mean, did you write Wayne Newton at SeaWorld? I did. Yeah, oh, jeez. <laughs> Cole Porter in Paris, starring Connie Stevens. <laughs> it was just who you want to hear sing Cole Porter <laughs> oh <my> in Paris. God, <laughs> a, a great woman. I'm a friend of hers and I'm a fan. But yeah. I mean, it just. But that was the kind of show, <laughs> know. you know. Steve and Edie sing the Beatles. This was, yeah, you know. And so this was, it wasn't so unusual. Sure. Because you would do this thing and it would have a theme and then you would load it up with uh, stars. You were cross-promoting things like it was a CBS show. So it was full of uh, Harvey Korman and originally Cher, but um, uh, she'd had a little surgery and she couldn't do it. And so Diane Carroll, who fit into the costume. She's the fantasy. Was the the fantasy sequence. Which, by the way, 
uh, was the first. She was the fantasy of one of the Wookies. Yes. Uh, and he was <laughs> yes. wearing a VR uh, yeah. helmet, yeah. which yeah. George kind of came up with. And now they exist. Wow. A virtual reality helmet. And it would plug in and you would and your fantasy would be realized. And she was his fantasy realized. I can't remember if it was itchy or lumpy. Was uh, it was the grandpa. Who oh, it was, was grandpa. The itchy. Lumpy right. was the right. kid. That's right. And uh, <laughs> itchy had the uh, fantasy. So it was the first interracial interspecies romance on network television. <laughs> Where is my NAACP image award? Yes. I ask you. <laughs> you have we one. broke ground. <laughs> uh, uh, I have to explain that they, um, the, they're they're on their way home to the Wookiee planet, Chewbacca, and he's in the the Millennium Falcon with Han Solo and Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker, and they stop off on the planet Tatooine with the cantina. That 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 yeah, that, sure. that, 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 that that's the cantina, and all these aliens are there. And uh, George had shot the Empire, but it was editing it, and so he had a whole bunch of new aliens. But he didn't want to uh, use them on the show. And he didn't want to design, build new aliens. So we used uh, remainder aliens. We went to the alien warehouse and pulled out the aliens that had not made the cut yeah. in the first two movies. And they were all like Elmer's glue all and scotch tape. And, and those were the aliens. Because, and one of them was like a huge vagina. And then it was like he had to be there while B. Arthur... B was that, singing a song. Yeah, yeah, she wanted the song, right? right? B was Maud at the time, and she had um, come from Broadway, where she had won the Tony for Mame as Vera Charles, and she had been the original Yen to the Matchmaker in Fiddler, and she wanted to sing. And uh, she she brought in a song that she wanted to sing, and she was, it was, you know, the dark alien bar, and she decided that she was the kind of Brechtian bartender, the woman who runs the thing. And she was very Statue of Liberty, you know, standing there. With mm-hmm. The, with her beer stein, and she wanted to sing the Alabama song <laughs> by Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weill. Oh, show me the way to the next whiskey <laughs> bar. Oh, don't ask why. Oh, and it ends with, I tell you, I will die. I tell you, I will die. And she said, this is my Brecht Weill number. And I said, it's B, it's your Weill Brecht number is what it is. Ah, but, very good. But we should, you know... And and uh, we had to clear it with Bertolt Brecht's estate, and they said, "What are you nuts? <laughs> you see, we wrote this so she should sing this thing on television with with the alien with the cunt face." <laughs> so, <laughs> so we had Ken and Mitzi oh, Welch, great. who had written all of those Carol oh, Burnett yes, medleys. Sure, they're and they wrote a piece of special material that was a sort of homage to Brecht and Weil. Uh huh. And uh, it was, I forget what the song was, but it was kind of like, it also was a lot like Those Were the Days, my friend. Yeah, I didn't write it down, but. Uh, It was one of those kinds of songs. And so it was a a bit more up than (laughs) the Alabama song. (laughs) Whose idea was it to put Harvey Corman in drag as a Julia Child type? I don't know. Well, I I remember it it may have been mine or it may have been Rod Warren, who was one of the writers, or Lenny Ripps, Uh or Pat Prof. They were all writers on Uh the show. And. You know, in in a stone session, who knows? Right, right. Uh, but we knew we had to use Harvey because Harvey was on the Burnett Show, which was a big CBS show, and part of it was of course, working the CBS people uh, in. Yeah, right. Um, and so we were trying to think of somebody funny Harvey would do, and Harvey, of course, loved to do drag. He loved to do the big bo- bo- and the big bo- bosomy, you know, as yeah. the stomach churns. Yes. And uh, uh, and so we thought it'd be funny to have him as Julia. There were a lot of people doing Julia Child. Dan Aykroyd sure. did the very funny one with all the blood, which sure. of course we couldn't do. But we had to do a different. So we had we said let's make Julia Child an alien and have her with cooking with eight arms, so she can do a million different things. You've brought it up to Lucas over the years when you've run into him. Oh, he he, he walks away. Walks away. Whenever I see him, he just you know, head goes and down. He doesn't, <laughs> doesn't want to be. Don't want to talk about it. 